This program contains dramatizations of the dark events in Salem Village in 1692. All dialogue comes from the historic records of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and is as it was. New England, 1692. A hostile land. The Puritans thought of North America as the devil's territory. The devil has been raised among us. A supernatural enemy. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, is a biblical passage. I seen the creature suck on another witch's finger. However, a charge of witchcraft was to take power over another human being. Is Salem besieged by Satan's witches? <laughs> or by madness? A corrupt court. They told me if I confess, I should have my life. A hanging judge. He believed in what the court was doing. What is your verdict? Guilty. The true story of the Salem witch hunt. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass. In many ways, for many years, hath the devil been essaying to destroy the kingdom of our Lord Jesus here. But now, there is more than ordinary affliction. October, 1692. Residents of the Massachusetts Bay Colony believe they are being attacked by a conspiracy of witches. A hunt is on to root out the forces of evil. Trials are being held in Salem town. 20 have been executed, and over a hundred accused witches are in prison. The devil has decoyed a fearful knot of malicious creatures to lift themselves in his horrid service. 29-year-old Cotton Mather has been asked by the governor of the colony to write an account of the crisis. The things confessed by witches and the things endured by others will be the subject of this account of our affliction. It had begun 10 months earlier, some 20 miles north of Boston, in a tiny farming community. Salem Village is an unhappy place, filled with angry factions who argue over land and money and religion. There is a new church, but also a contractual dispute over the minister's salary. Reverend Samuel Paris, age 39, a failed businessman, he has only recently become a minister. Some men laugh at sin, make a sport of sin, but the Holy Ghost tells us they are fools. Sin is the devil's vomit, the soul's excrement, the worst of all evils, the scum, the superfluity of evils. Paris berates his congregation, hoping to shame them into paying his salary. Little does he know that a witch hunt is about to be triggered by events in his own home. January, 1692. Mr. Samuel Paris, pastor of the church in Salem Village, had a daughter of nine, Betty Paris, and a niece of about 11 years of age, Abigail Williams. Sadly afflicted of they knew not what distempers. These children were bitten and pinched by invisible agents. Their arms, necks, and backs turned this way and that way so as it was impossible for them to do by themselves. At times they couldn't eat, at times they couldn't sleep or speak, and a doctor was called in. This was the traditional thing one did. 
But if the doctor couldn't understand what was going on, which was usually the case, the doctor would diagnose witchcraft. Witchcraft is an accepted reality in 17th century New England. The invisible world, full of malicious specters and malevolent witches, is as real to most Puritans as the rocks and trees. Witches were nasty people who went around cursing and producing damage. Uh, if you uh, didn't give me something that I asked for, I might put a curse on your cattle. And two weeks later, your prize heifer might die. It was a pervasive belief uh, at the time. It was part built into the legal code of the common law. Uh, it was a crime as well as a sin. The crime of witchcraft is punishable by death. Cotton Mather had written a highly popular book three years earlier about bewitchings, including an account of four children named Goodwin who, Mather said, were being tortured by invisible witches. The Goodwin children accused a woman known as Goody Glover as the person who had bewitched them. Uh, Goody Glover was brought to trial. She seems to have been Irish. She claimed to only speak Gaelic. They tried to get her to recite the Lord's Prayer. And Cotton Mather says in his book that no matter how many times they repeated it to her, she could not recite it accurately. And he regarded that as a sign that she was a witch. It was believed that no witch could accurately say the Lord's Prayer. Goody Glover was hanged in Boston on November 16th, 1688 for witchcraft. Witchcraft has its roots in folk magic. Since prehistoric times, there have been people who believe that charms and spells can improve fertility of crops and animals, fight sickness, show the future, or punish enemies. One early pagan god was half human, half goat. Early Christians added the wings of a fallen angel to make this their image of Satan. This cloven hooved devil needed servants to do his bidding. So he recruited witches, generally women, occasionally men, asking them to sell their eternal soul in exchange for some sexual pleasure or earthly favor. The deal was then documented in his book, where the witch made her mark in blood. Beginning in the 1490s, European churches and church-controlled governments began an organized campaign to destroy all remnants of paganism. Over the next 150 years, an estimated 50,000 people are burned and hanged. But by the late 1600s, the worst of the European witch hunts are over. The world is entering a new era of secular government and science. It is a time of great change, and not everyone is happy about it, least of all the followers of a highly conservative religious movement, Puritanism. Puritans founded the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1628. They called it their shining city on a hill, a frontier settlement run on strict religious principles. Puritanism was a religious movement that had arisen in England in the um, early 17th century. And the idea was to purify the English church of the sort of final remnants of Catholicism. Purification required a very strict interpretation of the Bible. The Bible, which was so crucial to Puritan thinking, uh, is very clear on the issue of witchcraft. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live is a biblical passage. Witches, it is believed, can send an invisible shape or specter to torment someone without being seen. Betty and Abigail act as if they are being hit by invisible forces. 
But if the young girls are bewitched, who is bewitching them? The hunt is about to begin. January 1692, and there is trouble in Salem Village. The minister's daughter and niece are exhibiting bizarre behavior. The village doctor says the girls are bewitched, but by whom? A neighbor suggests a folklore method for finding the witch. Paris's slave woman, Tichiba, follows the neighbor's instructions. Paris's Indian servant afterward confessed that without the knowledge of her master, she had taken some of the afflicted person's urine and mixing it with meal had made a cake and baked it to find out the witch. This witch cake is fed to a dog who, according to folk wisdom, will point the way to the guilty party. This clearly doesn't come out of Puritan theology. It comes directly out of popular magic culture, the kind of thing that Puritans were trying to su suppress. Reverend Paris is outraged. A church member has gone to the devil for help against the devil. And by this means, it seems, the devil has been raised among us. And his rage is vehement and terrible. Reverend Paris orders prayer and fasting to counteract the witchcraft. But the girl's strange behavior continues, stopping and starting unpredictably for weeks. Over three centuries later, it is difficult for us to believe that the children's fits were induced by invisible witches. But if they weren't bewitched, what was going on? I don't have a theory about the first fits in Salem Village. Um, what we do know is that the fits that the little girls in Paris's household suffered are very similar to the fits of the Goodwin children and other children in England and America who were raised in pious homes. Children in 17th century Western society were not so much objects of affection within a family as they were uh, sources of labor and young sinners who needed to be disciplined into good behavior. We go astray as soon as we are born. Undutiful children are the children of Satan, and unto Satan they shall go into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We can interpret it as children who are um, very deeply affected by concern for the ultimate fate of their souls. It seems to be a not usual but not unusual kind of pattern. But not all agree with this explanation. There are some who believe the girls' fits were triggered by poison. There's a theory that poisoning as it occurred in Salem was basically due to contaminated rye that led to um, hallucinogenic effects and all sorts of um, physical symptoms. Ergot is a type of fungus that grows on rye. People who eat bread containing this fungus have been known to experience nervous dysfunction. A victim twists and contorts in pain. In some cases, this is accompanied by hallucinations. In fact, LSD is derived from ergot fungus. But the ergot poisoning theory has been refuted by scientists and others. Some of them should have died from it, and the fact that one minute they're perfectly well-behaved or at least perfectly normal in their physical appearance and uh, asymptomatic, and the next moment uh, they're having their fits or whatever uh, are inconsistent with the sy symptoms of convulsive ergotism. The afflicted in Salem throw their fits in unison at convenient times 
such as when people come by to see them. This fact has led many to believe that the girls were simply faking it. But if the girls are play-acting, it is a deadly game. They could be accused of witchcraft themselves and hanged. It's possible to imagine with only a slight turn of events that the accusations of witchcraft might have been turned against the girls themselves if they had not been asked, who is it that afflicts you, and, and, and have started to name names in the village, they themselves might have, might have been suspected as the guilty parties. Pressured by Reverend Paris to name the witch whose specter is attacking them, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams point to an obvious scapegoat, Tichiba. Documents describe her and her husband as Indians, they are slaves from Barbados. She is dark-skinned, dark, like the Puritans' mortal enemies, the Wabanakis. As the original Puritan colony spread to the north, the English began to encroach on Wabanaki land. In North America, of course, they found native residents. Um, they believed that those people were worshipers of the devil. They uh, also thought that the Native Americans did not really have a right to the land because they didn't cultivate it, and therefore the land was pretty much free for the taking. But as the Indians see it, the Puritans are trespassers and worse. When a group of Wabanakis come to a town to trade, the militia captures them and sells them into slavery. They were mostly women and children. As you can well imagine, this angered the Wabanaki people to no end, and they were infuriated by the treachery that had led to the capture of so many of their people. Starting in 1675, the Wabanaki tribes launch a series of wars against the English. Sixteen years before the Salem witch hunt, on the main frontier. Good night, Mercy. Good night. This little girl, Mercy Lewis, will play a central role in the Salem witch trials. At the age of three, she is living in the town of Falmouth, Maine. The attack is swift and brutal. 23 women and children killed or captured, 11 men dead. Mercy's grandparents, aunts, uncles, and most of her cousins are among the victims. Years after surviving that Indian massacre in Maine, Mercy Lewis is 18 years old and living as a servant in Salem Village. were fighting for their lives. <coughs> One who did was running and was shot. He begged of them his life. They knocked him on the head and split open his bowels. <coughs> A 10-year truce with the Indians is coming to an end. News is grim. The town of York, Maine, is in flames. 50 dead, 100 taken into captivity by the Wabanakis. In January 1692, in Salem Village, it would have been bitter cold. And the news came from York about the Indian raid. Not all that far away, and people must have been terrified. Soon after hearing news of renewed Indian attacks, Mercy Lewis begins throwing fits, just like Betty and Abigail, and they are joined by others. Mercy Lewis works for the Putnam family, Anne Putnam Jr., age 12, Anne's mother, age 30, 
and Anne's cousin, Mary Walcott, 17. All are now acting bewitched. And it's spreading. Salem Village is a very small community, and all the afflicted would have known each other very well. There were little girls, there were teenagers and 20-somethings, and then there were some uh, married women who were also afflicted. Asked who is bewitching them, several of the newly afflicted also accuse the minister's dark-skinned slave, Tichuba. Since the younger girls' accusations cannot be used as evidence in court, these new accusations by adult witnesses are critical. Witch! I will beat the devil out of you! Now, legal action can be taken against Tichuba. A terrible machinery has been set in motion. It will take 20 people to their graves. March, Salem Village. Seven girls and women possessed by horrifying fits. They claim to be bewitched, and it is Reverend Paris's Indian slave, Tichuba, who is invisibly attacking them. Formal complaints are filed, transforming wild accusations into a legal procedure. One that unfolded in the Salem Village Meeting House over 210 years ago. In Salem Village in early March of 1692, um, the fields were frozen, nobody was outside working, and the place must have been jammed. Two magistrates from nearby Salem town, John Hathorne and Jonathan Corwin, come to Salem Village to conduct a preliminary examination to see if a trial is warranted. The accusers have been asked to point out the witch who torments them. What happens next is recorded for history in official transcripts. Tichuba. What evil spirit have you familiarity with? <laughs> Why do you hurt these poor children? What harm have they done unto you? They do no harm to me. I no hurt them at all. Why have you done it? I have done nothing. I can't tell when the devil works. No. What? Hath the devil told you he hurts you? He has seen the devil. No. He tells me nothing. Hathorne was an experienced magistrate, and he had obviously examined many uh, accused people before. His purpose was to elicit a confession from her. It was crucial to get confessions, to get a conviction in a capital case at this time. You had to have two witnesses to the actual act. And so, therefore, the easiest way to get a conviction was to get a confession. What is it you converse with all? The devil, for aught I know. What appearance? Or how will he appear when he hurts them? With what shape? Or what is he like when he hurts them? She's a person who is, has lived the life of being a slave. She's been hit before, and maybe it dawns on her that she'll be get hit worse. And so she tells the stories that she tells. Yesterday. I being in the lean-to chamber, I saw a thing like a man that told me to serve him. And I told him, no, I would not do such a thing. The devil, he should be a witch. What clothes does he appear to you in? Black clothes sometimes. He's a tall man with dark hair, I think. What other likenesses besides a man doth he appear to you? Sometimes like a hog. Sometimes like a great black dog. A black dog? What did she say? What? 
Tichuba's lurid imagery seems to cast a spell on the afflicted girls. Sometimes like a hog, sometimes like a great black dog. I seen a yellow bird suck on another witch's finger. I seen a yellow bird suck on another witch's finger. servant of the minister confessed to being a witch must have been mind-boggling to people. What is really significant, though, from a, from a legal point of view, is that Tichuba has offered a confession, and that is the thing that matters the most. They have their confession. Now that they have their confession, the witchcraft is a reality. Tichuba does more than just confess. She offers up the names of her fellow witches. Who else have you seen? Poor women, sometimes hurt the children. What did she say? Who were they? Goody Osborne. Goody Osborne. And Sarah Good. No. And someone I didn't know. And it's all magic. One of the interesting things that Tichuba said was that she had seen the Devil's Book and it had these other signatures in it so that the people in the community would have known that they had to go look for other witches. This is only an examination, not a trial. Magistrates Hathorn and Corwin do not have legal authority to convict and pass sentences but they do have the power to place suspects in custody. Tichuba is taken away to jail, along with two other witches, Sarah Good, a beggar with a bad temper, and Sarah Osborne, a woman of supposedly loose morals. Both deny vehemently that they are witches. But Tichuba has mentioned more witches and wizards, nine in all. That means seven others are still at large in the village. The hunt is on. Martha Corey, about 60 years old, is a respectable church member married to a prosperous, though argumentative and uneducated farmer, Giles Corey. The first three women accused were, were in one form or another outcasts uh, in the village, which was really quite a typical pattern for incidents of witchcraft accusation. Martha Corey was a full-fledged, full-covenant member of the Salem Village Church. If Martha Corey could be a witch, then anyone could be. Anne Putnam Jr. and Mercy Lewis claim that Martha Corey's specter torments them. She's Goody Corey's specter! Her specter is loose. Stop tormenting them! You are now in the hands of authority. Tell me now why you hurt these persons. I do not. Who don't? Pray, give me leave to go to prayer. I wish to go to prayer. Pray, give me leave we to go to prayer. We did not send for you to go to prayer. We came to be a terror to evildoers. <laughs> Tell me why you hurt me. I am an innocent person. I have never had to do with witchcraft since I was born. I am a gospel woman. Do not you see how these complain of you? <laughs> Lord, open the eyes of the magistrates and ministers. Lord, show his power to discover the guilty. Tell us who hurts these children. I do not know. In his examinations, Hathorne relies on what is called spectral evidence, a statement by a witness that she sees the specter of a witch do strange things. When you signed the devil's book, essentially you gave the devil permission to take your shape and to torment others. That invisible shape was considered a specter. What did he 
say to you? We must not believe what all these distracted children say. Cannot you tell what that man whispered? I saw nobody. But did you not hear? No. If you expect God's mercy, you must look for it in God's way by confession. Do you not see how these afflicted to charge you? Stop biting her lips. I order you to stop biting your lip. Look what you do to these girls. What harm is there in it? I can't unclench my hands. Stop biting her Bird stuck on your finger. The Lord have mercy. Tell me why you hurt these children or who don't. But I have no hand in it. But if you will all go hang me now, how can I help it? Switch, switch, switch. The more she objects, the more entangled she becomes. There is no way out of the madness. Somebody stop her. Since the powers of darkness are turned upon us, is a dark time. Yea, a black night indeed. Now the tie dogs of the pit are abroad among us. Must the very devils be sent out of their own place to be our troublers? Salem Village, April 1692. Madness is in the air. Anything odd is seen as a sign of witchcraft. Wild stories are accepted as legal evidence, and everyone is a possible witch. The floodgates opened in April and May so that more and more people were accused, uh, people not just from Salem Village, but from Salem Town uh, and the surrounding communities. It just festered very quickly, and you get a real sense that it suddenly became a panic. By the end of April, there are six more accused witches, bringing the total held in jail to 10. Salem was a primary jail, but it was really supposed to only operate for awaiting people to go to trial and not being a place where you uh, uh, put them for months at a time. The wooden jail is a deep freeze in winter and an oven in summer. Hygiene was basically um, some kind of a, a pot uh, by, uh, by one of the, the walls. And if you've got a lot of people and you don't uh, change the pot on a regular basis, um, I think it was very, very difficult for them. If a person is a witch, it is often assumed that her family might be as well. One of the first to be accused, Sarah Good, is jailed with her four-year-old daughter, Dorcas. After eight months in these conditions, the little girl will go insane. Anyone accused of witchcraft is guilty until proven innocent. No one has been convicted yet, but their lives are already ruined. To levy a, a charge of witchcraft was, in fact, uh, to take power over the, the life and reputation uh, of another human being uh, in the village. Accused witches are interrogated while being held prisoner. They are stripped so that investigators can look for telltale marks called witches' teats. It was believed that the devil communicated with his witches through animal familiars. And the animal familiars were little creatures, like sometimes mice or birds, who would come to suck at a teat on the witch's body, and that would leave a mark. Adding insult to injury, the accused witches are charged for their own room and board while in jail. If you wanted to eat or drink, um, the jailer would give you a food, but you would have to pay for it. Uh, and if you wanted good straw or if you wanted new bedding uh, every week or so, you would have to pay for that as well. There is money to be made off of the witch hunt. And a lot of that money goes to Sheriff George Corwin, nephew to one of the magistrates. Sheriff Corwin is related to the Magistrate Corwin. He's related to some other people also on the trial court, so there's something a bit incestuous about all of this. It is not possible that the authorities could have been ignorant of what Sheriff Corwin was doing. That simply is 
implausible. Sheriff George Corwin confiscates the property of many accused witches. As some of the people are being arrested and taken away, Corwin goes over and starts appropriating their property, and he has no legal right to do so. But Corwin was, uh, was grabbing wherever he could grab. Perhaps the Corwins encourage the witch hunt to line their own pockets. Others may be using witch accusations to even old scores. In Salem Village, there is no shortage of bitter, long-standing disputes to be settled. New Englanders in the 17th century were very fond of taking each other to court, suing each other. And there's, I think, a historical reason for that. One thing that's true of English popular culture is that it was pretty violent. People hit each other, beat each other. There was just a, a lot of a lot of physical violence going on. And one of the things the Puritans tried to purge uh, in their model community was that physical violence. And so instead of hitting people, uh, the Puritans encouraged people to sue each other. In Salem Village, one name appears as plaintiff in many of the lawsuits, Putnam. Thomas Putnam, Jr., aged 40. Thomas and his wife, Anne, are devoted churchgoers and ardent supporters of the minister, Samuel Parris. Samuel Parris had important opponents in Salem Village. He also had powerful supporters. The most powerful group of his supporters was a clan, a large clan that came close to dominating Salem Village politics for many years, named the Putnams. Thomas and most of the other Putnams support the idea of Salem Village having its own church. Many others would rather walk five miles to the church in Salem Town rather than pay double the taxes to have one nearby. For years, this issue has divided Salem Village into two angry factions. There's a clear continuity between all the old faction lines and the pattern of outbreak of witchcraft accusations uh, in 1692. It's striking correlation. Thomas Putnam and the women in his family, his daughter, wife, niece, and the servant, Mercy Lewis, are behind 181 accusations of witchcraft. Thomas's brother, Edward, participates in 13 cases. Brother-in-law, Jonathan Walcott, in an additional seven witch hunts. People who have done the Putnam clan wrong are dragged in on charges of witchcraft, like George Burroughs. Reverend George Burroughs, aged 42, a Harvard graduate, witty, married three times. He had held Samuel Parris's job as minister of Salem Village 10 years prior, from 1680 to 1683. The period of the ministry of George Burroughs in the village was a, a very contentious one. The villagers began to uh, withhold his salary, which was their standard tactic when they started to feud with their ministers. And that meant that Burroughs could not repay his own debts. Burroughs had borrowed money from a Putnam. When he couldn't repay it, Burroughs was arrested. But he successfully argued in court that he couldn't repay debts until the town paid his salary. Though the debt is finally repaid, the Putnams never forget their humiliation in court. By the time of the witch hunt in 1692, Burroughs is working as a preacher in the remote frontier settlements of Maine. He has survived the brutal Indian attacks that had killed many of Mercy Lewis's relatives, but he will not survive the vengeful Putnams of Salem Village. On the evening of April 20th, 1692, Anne Putnam Jr. says that the invisible specter of George Burroughs comes and speaks to her. She declared that Burroughs confessed to her that not only was he the leader of the witches, not only had he killed his first two wives, but he had also killed the wife and daughter of his predecessor. And most importantly of all, he had uh, bewitched the soldiers who were fighting the Indians on the main frontier.
It has been five months since the first girls started having fits in Salem Village. Now, in May 1692, the hunt for the witches who caused those fits is about to become a crisis for the entire Massachusetts Bay Colony. Have you baptized your children? George Burroughs has been brought to Salem Village all the way from Maine. During preliminary questioning, Reverend Burroughs displays a defiantly relaxed attitude toward religious ritual. When did you last partake in the Lord's Supper? It is so long since I cannot tell. Have you not been to a Sabbath meeting since you can remember? I was at meeting one Sabbath at Boston part of the day, and at Charlestown part of a Sabbath. The sacrament happened to be at both, but I did not partake of either. Is your house at Casco Bay haunted and filled with toads, as some say? Not haunted, no. But there are toads there in summer. The arrest of George Burroughs captures the attention of the entire Massachusetts Bay Colony. Cotton Mather and other clergy are especially concerned. They already know about this renegade minister, George Burroughs. He has never been formally ordained by the Puritan church. To be an ordained minister, you had to have a formally organized congregation of people who had formally become church members. Burroughs never successfully had an organized congregation. To Cotton Mather, Burroughs represents all that is wrong in a colony that is drifting away from its original religious purpose. Many of the settlers in Falmouth, Maine, lived themselves too like unto the heathen, without any instituted worship. The magistrates have the legal power to examine Burroughs, but not convict or hang him. The local jails are now crowded with accused witches awaiting trial. On May 27th, the governor orders a special court to convene in Salem town. There is a jury of men from around the county and a panel of distinguished judges. None of the judges had any particular legal training. They were merchants and um, other leaders of the colony. The Chief Justice, William Stoughton, is also Lieutenant Governor of the colony. He is known to be a rigid and dogmatic Puritan. This special court would have differed from courts today in that the defendant had no right to an attorney there was no defense attorney in 17th century English law. The accused witch must defend herself, a difficult task when dealing with spectral evidence. The first case heard by the official court is that of Bridget Bishop. About 50 years old, she was also tried for witchcraft 12 years earlier and found innocent. But this time, the rules seem to be different. One of the witnesses against Bridget Bishop was a 32-year-old man named John Lauder who claimed that some years before, uh, Bridget Bishop had uh, crept into his room at night. About the dead of night, I felt a great weight upon my breast, and awakening looked, and it being bright moonlight, did plainly see, said Bridget Bishop, or her likeness, sitting upon my stomach. What did he say? Now, of course, this was not literally Bridget Bishop. This was the specter of Bridget Bishop. This was Satan who had taken on the form of Bridget Bishop. And I had not the power in my hands to resist or to help myself. It was her specter. Bridget Bishop's accusers are not confined to the witness stand. People saying that Bridget Bishop is tormenting them disrupt the trial. They completely influence, completely dominate all the courtroom proceedings. Now, this is very interesting because 
and the defense lawyer would absolutely just stop the proceeding immediately and ask for the girls to be excused from the courtroom because their presence was just too prejudicial. But in 1692, there is no defense attorney to object. Their afflictions are needed as evidence in order to hang the witches. Either someone stuck a pin in her, or she stuck it in her herself. Okay? I can't think of any other alternative. So, I suspect fraud here. The pin is fraud, but that doesn't mean that you have to throw out the rest as being completely fraud. In psychiatry, if people do something wrong <laughs> without having the intention, this is not really fraud. Modern psychologists know there are cases of unintentional fraud, bizarre and dishonest behavior beyond anyone's control. At that time, it was thought of witchcraft. Now, in the 20th century, it's called a mass psychogenic disorder. Different labels, same behavior. Caught in a wave of mass hypochondria, the afflicted of Salem begin to mimic the symptoms they see in each other. Those girls were carried away, and there was this one-upsmanship again uh, among themselves, so the affliction spread, and everybody wanted to be in the limelight. What is your verdict? We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Guilty, they say she's guilty. She's a witch. She's a witch. Don't you know it. On June 2nd, 1692, Judge William Stoughton issues the trial's first death sentence. Found guilty of the felonies in witchcrafts whereof she stood indicted, and sentence of death accordingly passed against her as the law directs. Their Majesties William and Mary, now King and Queen, allow you that upon this Friday, being the tenth day of this instant month of June, you safely conduct the said Bridget Bishop from their Majesty's jail in Salem to the place of execution, and there cause her to be hanged by the neck until she be dead. On June 10th, 1692, Bridget Bishop becomes the first witch to hang in Salem Village. Hang the witch! Hang her! Hang her! The person was turned off the ladder, and by swinging free, you weren't your neck was not broken. Instead, you slowly strangled to death, depending upon your weight. <laughs> Disgusted by the hanging, one of the judges resigns in protest. The witch trials carry on without interruption. July 19th in Salem Village. Five more women are executed. Rebecca Nurse and Sarah Good from the village and three more from neighboring towns. They are hanged because they do not confess, because they refuse to name others as witches. A strange pattern has emerged. Those who, like Tichuba, confess to witchcraft and give names of more witches are never convicted. They wanted more confessions, and there was an implicit bargain that was being offered. You confess and we don't execute you. But not everybody is willing to accept that plea bargain. Right honorable sirs, I bring before you accused witch, Minister George Burroughs. What we have in the case of George Burroughs is a 
quite detailed description that Cotton Mather included in Wonders of the Invisible World, and his account tells us pretty much what happened. There were now heard the testimonies of several persons, and these charged the specter of George Burroughs to have a share in their torments. Many travel from Boston to Salem Town to watch the trial. The Putnam family sits at the front. Their maid, Mercy Lewis, is the first to testify. She describes an encounter with the specter of George Burroughs. He told me the devil was his servant, and he did most dreadfully torment me, as though he would have racked me all to pieces. He urged me to write in his book, or else he would kill me. As a child, Mercy Lewis had witnessed an Indian attack in Falmouth, Maine. An attack that had killed many of her closest relatives. Later, she worked as a servant to Reverend Burroughs. He was described as having dark skin, and some wondered how he had escaped not one, but several Indian raids unscathed. Abigail Williams calls him the little black minister, black, like an Indian. This is one of the comments that Cotton Mather makes in his report that a number of the afflicted people and others see the devil in the shape of an Indian. The prodigious war made by the spirits of the invisible world upon the people of New England in the year 1692 might have some of its origins among the Indians, whose chief sagamores are well known to have conversed with demons. George Burroughs, have you anything to say in your defense? court is crowded with witnesses against Burroughs. George Burroughs was accused by eight of the confessed witches as being the head actor at some of their hellish rendezvous, and one who had the promise of being a king in Satan's kingdom. When one thinks of the status of a minister in Puritan culture uh, to, uh, to identify a minister as, in fact, the leader of a demonic conspiracy. It must have been just a horrendous thought for, for the people of the day. It was totally shocking to Cotton Mather. Uh, it was almost beyond belief. Burroughs proclaims his innocence. He even goes a step further. He dares to challenge the very existence of evil specters. I maintain that there neither are nor ever were witches, that having made a compact with the devil can send a devil to torment other people at a distance. Burroughs' open defiance of Puritan theology is blasphemous. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Guilty? Guilty. August 19th, the day of George Burroughs' execution, Minister Cotton Mather makes the long trek from Boston to witness the hanging. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. With the noose around his neck, Burroughs begins to recite the Lord's Prayer. Cotton Mather himself has written that this is something witches can never do. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Imagine the presence of mind it must have taken as you're literally facing death to, I don't think I could remember the Lord's Prayer under those circumstances, but he did. And, and the, the record 
reports that, that the crowd almost literally began to surge forward to, to prevent this hanging. He recited the Lord's Prayer! Remember, George Burroughs is no ordained minister. The devil has often transformed himself to an angel of light. Cotton Mather, who had come out from Boston to observe the event, quieted the crowd, assured them that this man was guilty as charged, the, the, the uh, hanging was uh, a just act, and, and only in that way did the proceedings go on. is left to swing, slowly strangling to death. Cotton Mather's public endorsement of Burroughs' hanging will have deadly consequences. It heralds the bloodiest chapter of the witch hunt, the September executions. September, 1692. It is the final and bloodiest chapter of the Salem witch trials. By month's end, nine more people will die by hanging, and worse. Giles Corey, husband to accused witch Martha Corey. Giles now finds himself accused in turn. But when Giles is brought to trial, he refuses to play along. Since this court had only found everyone that was brought before them guilty, he had decided that once he pled not guilty, he was not going to cooperate anymore. It was an exquisite protest on his part. Giles will not take part in the madness, and so becomes its victim. They tried to force him physically to plead. And the way they did that was to place him on the ground and then pile onto his chest an increasing number of stones. They kept piling more stones and waiting. It took two days when he was asked, well, are you willing to plead now? He's reputed to have said, more weight. Finally, he died. Uh, a terrible ending. But they never convicted him of witchcraft. Giles Corey's wife, Martha Corey, also refuses to confess to witchcraft. She is hanged three days later on September 22, 1692, along with seven others who refused to confess to a crime they did not commit or to accuse their neighbors in order to save themselves. They are martyrs, part of a growing trend of resistance to the witch hunt. There were people all along who had been waiting for a moment where they could step in in the openly and uh, credibly uh, demand that the trials be stopped. Uh, and those people had to bide their time because if they acted prematurely, they could be subject to accusation and death themselves. But I think that by, by mid-September, it had really reached the point where they realized mm -hmm. it's now or never. As more and more people began to raise questions about the court, the debate became louder and louder in Boston in particular. Wealthy Boston merchant Thomas Brattle is one of those who begin to openly criticize the judge's methods. With respect to such as confess themselves to be witches, I cannot but tell you they do often contradict themselves. Even the judges themselves have caught them in flat lies. But the judges then vindicate these confessors and say the devil takes their memory. Some confessors who have named others as witches in exchange for their own lives begin to have second thoughts. 
17-year-old confessed witch, Margaret Jacobs. Her accusations help hang Minister George Burroughs and her own grandfather, 80-year-old George Jacobs. The day after her grandfather is executed, Margaret Jacobs dictates a letter to the judges. What I said was altogether false against my grandfather and Mr. Burroughs. They told me if I would not confess, I should be put down into the dungeon and would be hanged. But if I confess, I should have my life. She really felt responsibility for that, and she thought she would rather die than continue to play this game of pretending as the others were doing. And Margaret Jacobs is not the only one recanting her confession. Soon, the judges have no choice. They begin to try even those who have cooperated. Not surprisingly, people stop confessing. The wild accusations come to an abrupt halt. Cotton Mather's own father, Reverend Increase Mather, writes a powerful plea to the court. The whole thrust of the document was to issue warnings about the dangers of, of, of improper accusations. And they sum it up in the phrase, it were better that 10 accused witches uh, should be spared than that one innocent person uh, should die. At the end of October, the governor dissolved the court. When the trials resumed in regular courts, spectral evidence was no longer allowed. But they did have to have more trials. There were still a lot of people in jail. Those people could not simply be freed. They had to be brought through a judicial process. And in fact, three more people were convicted, but the governor reprieved all of them. When Judge Stoughton, who had presided over the Salem witch trials, hears that the governor has reprieved the last three witches, he rages. Thereby the kingdom of Satan is advanced, and the Lord have mercy on this country. William Stoughton was a true believer. He believed in what the court was doing. He believed in what he was doing. That's who he was. It takes another three months before the 49 remaining accused witches are released. Three have already died in jail while awaiting their freedom. Margaret Jacobs' release is delayed because she doesn't have money for her jail fee. Tichiba had been the first person accused. A year after her arrest, she is released to a new master because Reverend Samuel Paris refuses to pay her jail expenses. 1697, one of the judges, Samuel Sewell, asks for the public's pardon in their prayers, that God will prevent his past sins from further damaging the country. 1703, the general court of the Massachusetts Bay Colony throws out most of the evidence used in the witch trials. 1706, at the age of 24, Ann Putnam Jr. makes a formal apology to her church and to the families of those she helped execute. I did it not out of anger, malice, or ill will to any person, but what I did was done ignorantly, being deluded by Satan. 1711, the colony begins the process of paying some monetary compensation to families of the accused. But Sheriff George Corwin never returns the property he confiscated illegally. If you Hathorne continues to live in Salem until his death on the 10th of May, 1717, aged 76 years. He never apologizes. After 1692, there are no more prosecutions for witchcraft. People didn't stop believing in witches overnight, but the legal system stopped dealing with accusations of witchcraft. The legal system was simply not willing to engage with the folk belief of individuals that their neighbors were witches any longer. It was too devastating, I think, psychologically. There were too many people who had died. And 
what is really so... Over three centuries later, in the home of one of the victims of the witch hunt, a group of historians debate the significance of the event. Of course, this is right on the cusp of the beginning of the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, uh, in the sense that um, the world in which invisible spirits surround people is a pre-Enlightenment world. Right, but in our post-Enlightenment world, we have loads of people who are uh, having experiences with UFOs. Uh, so I don't, I, I think this theory of progress, it just isn't linear. There is such an assumption that we would know better now. Yes. Such an assumption that somehow, if only we had been there, yes. that we would have stopped it immediately. <laughs> right. We would have seen through it. Right. And, and we would have known there were no spectrum. We would have known there were, and we would have right. told them how to handle right. it, and, and, and it would have worked. And yet it seems very clear that at the time, people of intelligence and goodwill were actually taken in. And, and clearly this was a very scary and difficult to interpret and very difficult to dismiss uh, set of events. If we could push this one step further and look at the present. In the aftermath of the witch hunt, Cotton Mather regretted that innocent lives might have been taken. But who was to blame? Was it Satan? Or was it the Puritans themselves? Did we not, between the sufferers on the one hand and the suspected on the other, carry things to such extremes of passion that the devil did bless himself to find such a convenient home among us? It may be that the anger which we have had against one another has had more than a little influence on bringing the devil to us.